Hey everybody, welcome to the Tech Tips with Todd and Tony, and we're actually going to do a five-part series on everything you need to know about solar. Now, one of the things that we do here is, uh, you know, I, I personally teach on solar, and I get tons of questions on that. We do tech tips and everything else, but we decided, hey, why don't we do a long form and kind of go over in detail how to actually, con uh, things you need to consider in order to put on a, a solar system, a complete solar system. So yep. that's what we're going to do these times, uh, these uh, five episodes here. So Yep. And some of the stuff is going to be very basic, like this first segment is things to consider before buying a solar system. So there are some things um, when determining your energy needs for your RV. Sure. So I don't know if that's basic. It's actually necessary, right? It, but it is. But when people think about buying uh, a solar system, they just automatically jump to what's the most amount of solar panels and what's the most amount of batteries I can put in my rig. At least that's what I did Right. when uh, we put ours together. We were just like, all right, what can fit? Exactly. And, you know, if you're living in a teardrop, that that's a big consideration. Um, but we were in a Class A, and yeah. we just wanted the most. But if you take a systematic approach to it and say, all right, here's what I'm – needing it for you can actually tailor a system and that's what you guys do at right. big beard batteries every single day is you're taking these these wants and needs and then converting that into actual product systems. lists yeah. <laughs> yeah custom system for that individual so we came up with a list of, of good questions uh okay. we pulled our audience and um so here here's the first one for you All right when determining your energy needs, what are some common appliances or devices that people often want power with solar energy? All right. Um, I'm going to break this down into two categories. Um, first would be the large appliances that need a lot of um, power in order to run. So namely your air conditioner um, during the summer and maybe the uh, space heater or fireplace during the winter. Um, then you got other things that you're going to run either all day or continuously for multiple hours. Uh, that would be the refrigerator. And then maybe, you know, a CPAP machine or something like that if you're, you know, of course, using one and you want to sleep at least Right, if hours. you're snoring. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, high demand um, appliances, you know, because solar systems are really tailored to the individual. And some people, you know, cost is always a factor. Space is a factor. I mean, we all want everything uh, to be able to be ran. And, you know, there's a huge consideration with that cost. Uh, others, it may be, well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at moving. I don't need the large appliances, but I do want this, you know, this uh, this motor over here, this this appliance over here, but it's one of those that's going to run, you know, 8, 10, 24 hours a day. Mm. So those are some of the considerations. How big, uh, what's the largest appliance you want to run, right? Because then from there, that helps us determine what size inverter you need in order to, you know, supply that power. And then how long you want to run them would be how much supply, batteries, solar panels, you know, how long do you want to run that? Now, are you seeing with the advent of like these larger, you know, 300 amp hour big beard batteries, are we seeing people um, kind of lean more towards, okay, let's let's run the AC with my solar power system? Yeah. And it, it's so funny because uh, most of the builds that we do are for the larger systems, um, to be honest. And I think what it is, is there's still the learning curve for a lot of people out there that, oh, this is achievable to run an AC, two ACs, and even three ACs. You know, and just like with everything, uh, the hardest part uh, or the most cost is in the entry, right? In other words, a, a small system still costs just as much as a larger system, but the more you add, it gets a little bit cheaper per unit because of all the components you need uh, to install in order to make the whole thing work in the first place. Right, so like your inverter, your solar controller... You know, so with one solar panel, one battery, you still need all this other stuff, all this stuff to put it together it to communicate. Gotcha. Correct. So just adding extra solar panels and extra batteries will marginally al allow you to do a lot more things. So yeah, you want to run that air conditioner. So or as you you like to say, if you don't want to RV correctly, yeah. and you find yourself in Florida in August, having enough solar power to be able to run the AC during the day, and then enough battery power to run your AC in the evening. There you go. Yep. Now you got it down. You know, how many panels you need for the day, how many batteries you need for the night. All right, so this is a very simple question. How does the available space on an RV impact the size and type of solar panels that can be installed? So there are 
like when you when you look up solar panels online, you see these, you know, standard what is it like three feet or two and a half feet. Oh, I thought you were doing this. It's like I wouldn't buy any of those. No, yeah, this is a trickle charger. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I've seen you install like yeah. massive size, like it spans the entire RV. Yeah. Oh, and I'm really going to break it down to about three different sizes, to be honest. Okay. So the problem that we have is there's a curvature on the roof. Um, and with solar panels, cost per watt, the larger the panel, um, you know, per panel, you're actually going to pay less cost per watt. What am I saying? A 400 watt panel does not cost twice as much as a 200 watt panel. Mm. Okay. So when we're looking at cost per watt, you know, you would like a selection of large panels to fit in the areas on the roof where you can put a large panel. But you don't want to get so large because of the curvature of the roof that you've got wings, mm. you know, basically out there. So we limit it to about three sizes. And um, typically it's going to be in the 300 watt range between 300 and 350 because the basically the simple science to solar panels, the higher the watts, the bigger space it's going to take up. Mm-hmm. Smaller watts, smaller panel, right? And so the you know what we have found with you know hundreds of builds is you know there's a there's a optimum uh, size the 300 watt panels and the 200 watt panels is typically what we use um, on any RV where we're going to attach them directly to the roof without floating over the system. Now, um, typically on the RV, depending on the size, the maximum that you can put up there without floating is about between 2,000 and 3,000 watts. You know, sun, you know, Sunstrike, so that can run an AC. But then I have others that, hey, I want to run two ACs and not use the batteries for the day. And that's where we have to float them over the air conditioners. Okay. You get upwards of 6,000 watts there. So if you're thinking about, you know, what kind of RV should I buy, really that's when you need to be thinking about what kind of solar system you want or what kind of appliances you want to run because you may need – a little bit of a longer right. RV, you know? but also, you know, typically what I do is I don't I don't tell people what they need. I ask them, tell me, what do you envision yourself doing if you could take your power with you, and mm-hmm. when do you do it? In other words, when you're it's summertime, where are you going? Are you going south? Oh well, that's at least two ACs, right? Just you know, because we all know you're not going to run one AC and be comfortable if you're on the coast in Texas or Alabama, Florida. Uh, Louisiana, mm-hmm. it's going to be oppressively hot. There's going to be two ACs that are needed. Um, but you have others that, hey, look, we head north in the summer. I can still get away with one AC. Yeah, you're just taking off the edge. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah part one of AC that is, in the summer down south is not going to work. No. No. So, again, I, I would say, where do you envision yourself going? You know, and what do you envision yourself running? Okay. So, basically, that would sum up the first segment, which would be what do you want to run? How yeah. long do you think you need to run it for based on what you're looking for? And then, you know, one consideration is, do I have enough rig yeah, true. to to hold the amount of equipment needed? You know, so there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff to think about. So when it comes down to it, the best thing to do is probably reach out to your team and say, all right, here's what I want to do. What do you think? Right. Because there's what you want and then what will actually work but also your pocketbook. And then also you got to get into tow capacity. You know, what? what is the rate, weight rating? Holy moly, that's right. The, you know, if it's a towable, how much available space, cargo carrying capacity on that rear axle, you know, can you apply over there? So, yeah, there's a... And then if it can handle it, correct. then if it's a fifth wheel, that 20% that you're adding to the truck, can your truck handle it then? Right. So there's a lot of things to think about. Correct. It's not just, I want to run my AC. Yeah. Go big or go home. Right? <laughs> right. Go big and you may not be able to pull your home. Right. It is we'll your see. home at that point. Yeah. 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 Um, is there anything else that people should consider before buying a solar power system? Uh, well, yeah. Um, again, there is um, there is a little bit of learning and uh, a huge learning curve when it comes to this because you're, sep- you know, you're actually – supplementing the um, energy system and every once in a while you got to communicate with it sometimes the system will protect you and shut down and you need to know why it shut down so there is a learning curve when you put in a big system you know that we get calls hey look my system's beeping at me what does that mean or hey my batteries are dead what do i do like, it means you didn't put a big enough system in <laughs> or when it beeps at you that means hey look you're getting low stop running all your appliances so right. here's the thing. 
very seldom can we build a system that totally meets your needs because RVs are so small, right? Yeah, we'd love to have this this much out here, but whether the RV space, you know, the, the available space on the RV or your pocketbook, to be honest, um, affords you enough to be able to get everything you want. So there's a little bit of, um, how do I put this, uh, give and take when it comes to a solar system. So if you had to choose a style of RV, yeah. That would be the most conducive to a solar-powered, you know, full off-grid, full-time living. What style RV is that? Fifth wheel or fifth wheel toy hauler. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's there's enough space. Now, especially with a toy hauler, I can, it all depends on what you're using that space for. But there's enough roof up there uh, for you to do a lot of things. You can actually float over it with some low-profile air conditioners. But it's about where you can put stuff. And on a larger fifth wheel, triple axle also uh, can handle the weight because you're you're going to add anywhere between um, 200 pounds to 700 pounds worth of solar system depending on how big the solar system is so that eats into your cargo carrying capacity on the rv but also on the truck having a big fifth wheel triple axle you know however that doesn't mean you need to do that i could take a little travel trailer throw out three or four panels give you nearly a thousand watts Get you pretty dang I'm close just on the solar to run a small AC with a little bit of help of a battery, maybe a small generator. Piece of but, cake. Yeah. And you can put those wise. batteries under the bed in the front most yeah. times. So now with the 300 amp hour Big Beard batteries, they're, I mean, they're almost the size of a regular size battery. Three of those is now 900 amp hour. So yeah. that's quite a bit. All right. So we'll move on to the next segment. All right, so now part two of a four-part series here of yeah. you know trying to figure out everything you need to know when you are wanting to buy an RV solar system, solar yeah. power system, you know from things to consider to the components to installation and then maintenance and uh, operation. And this segment we're going to talk about the different components because there's a lot of different components out there. Every right. one of you know solar panels and batteries. You 100%. Everybody's got that down. Yeah, everybody. I, at least I would down. think so. Yeah, no. But there's a lot of parts in between, right? Oh, absolutely. So listen. And- Yep, go ahead. Oh, I don't think everyone has it down on solar panels either. Well, I think they, they've heard of them. You've yeah. heard of solar panels gotcha. and you've heard of batteries. Yeah. But there's a lot of pieces in between that do a lot of different things. And um, you know, in the first segment, you talked about the different sizes of panels. Do you want to you go over kind of the you know what to look for in a panel? You, you touched on it a little bit already, but there's, there's a couple different types, right? Sure, sure. And so different types. Uh, and, you know, we get this question a lot, you know, um, two different types and just the way they're made, monocrystalline and polycrystalline. Okay. That's just the, you know, components that they're using uh, to make a solar panel. And in short, what it is, is you have um, a higher quality panel and then kind of a not so high quality panel. And you would assume that the not so high quality panel would be cheaper than the higher quality panel. But the question is, is the juice worth the squeeze. Hmm. You have limited amount of space on the RV, okay? Yes, you may save, you know, a, you know, 25, 30 bucks per panel by going with a polycrystalline, but the problem is you won't get near as many potential watts. Hmm. So basically what it is, if we just break it down by efficiency, a, a monocrystalline panel, which is the, the good quality, you know, with current uh, technology that we have, Um, will get you anywhere between, you know, 20 and 24% efficiency. A polycrystalline, which is kind of a, you know, a lower quality type uh, process, 19% efficiency is all you're going to get. So, again, is the juice worth the squeeze? If if this table just, you know, represents an RV roof, there's only so much space that we can put solar panels up here. And because there's other components that we got to get to, there's a lot less space. Mm-hmm. If we go with a polycrystalline panel, let's say this size right here, um, it may be able to produce 100 watts. Okay, now not this size right here, but let's just say that a monocrystalline panel, the same size, may actually produce 150 watts. So again, um, there is two different types out there, um, and if space wasn't an issue, in other words, if you were to ground mount these, put them on the ground, and you had couple acres yeah sure you can do the 
the uh, polycrystalline and save some money. Yeah, I guess if you find that you only need this many and that many would fit on your roof, yeah. then I guess you could afford to go cheaper. But if you have you know, restricted space and you need to hit a certain number, yeah. you know, it makes more sense. Right. Gotcha. So there we go. So there's a science behind it. A little it's bit. It's not just throwing up panels. Right. Hmm. There's a little bit to it. Um, and I will say rigid versus the um, flexible. You yeah. want to go rigid. The flexible panels, you're having to glue uh, directly to the roof. And the roof is sitting in the sun the whole day. Yeah, and it's a so lot of heat. You get a lot of heat. And heat is a resistor when it comes to electricity, which lowers your efficiency. So, again, limited space, better to go with a rigid panel. You get way more watts throughout the day. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's move uh, right into the solar tr- uh, controller then, I guess. All right. So, um, again, if, if we can tie in when you get your design done, yeah. you have so much space, you have so many panels. There's different types, uh, different sizes of solar controllers, and um, can you just run through that and what sure. uh, what it does and yeah. okay and, and how how to make sure you're you're getting the right one. Yeah. So here's the thing: solar panels do produce DC voltage, right? But the amount of voltage varies. The bigger the panel, the higher the voltage. The whole concept of a solar panel connected to a battery is to charge the battery or supply let's say 12 volts, 24 volts, or 48 volts, okay? A solar panel doesn't come out of the box producing 12 volts, 24 volts, or 48 volts, all right? It has a maximum voltage, and it all depends on sun strike. The sun's hitting it from the side, you may get 2 or 3 volts. Hits it straight up there, you may get 20 volts. Back to the side, back to 2. The problem is your battery can't handle all of that change in voltage, so you have to have a solar controller that takes that high voltage, say upwards of 20, drops it down to your battery voltage, whether you have a 12-volt system or a 24-volt system, and then just by simply using Watt's Law and you know, increasing the flow, that's, what, that's where we get the power. So a solar controller takes the random high voltage from your solar panel or solar panel array and steps it down to your battery voltage. You may know this like a converter. All RVs have a converter. We call that a battery charger as well. We take the 120 volts that's coming in from the pedestal, we step it down, convert it back over to DC, because 120 volts is AC, and it charges the battery, but it also will run the 12 volt appliances, the converter. Well, that's what this is. Instead of pulling the power from a pedestal, we're getting power from light, photovoltaic, or what we typically call solar. It's high voltage. And this little component right here steps it down to battery voltage. Gotcha. Right? Keeps it safe. All right. We, so when you're sizing these up, oh, yeah, you yeah. have a certain amount of solar panels. Do you want to get the one that can handle that, or do you want to add for growth? What, what do you want to do there? Yeah. So this is where it gets a little confusing. On these you know, uh, electrical components, it'll always give you a data plate. Yeah. Right? Tells you what the maximum voltage is and what the maximum amperage is. Okay, solar panels, we look at it in watts. I buy a 200-watt panel, a 300-watt panel, or a 400-watt panel. If I did the math, right, I can look at the maximum voltage, maximum amperage, and determine what my maximum wattage is. So like in this case, I have a 150-volt solar controller. It's not always going to get 150 volts. That's just telling us that I can put enough panels up there in series to create higher voltage, but I don't dare get above 150 volts. If I can send enough voltage with enough solar panels, right, with good sun strike, this little solar controller can step it down to 12 volts, but then kick up the amperage flow to charge the batteries up to 70 amps. So one way of looking at this is saying, okay, 70 amps at 12 volts. I'll say just easy math, right? You're around, what, 1,000 watts? Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's about 1080 on the watts, so about 1,000 watts. Okay. What we want to do is we want to try and get a solar controller that's roughly about the same amount of maximum wattage of my solar panels. All right. So if this can produce at 12 volts, about 1080, somewhere around there, uh, worth of uh, watts, then I want about 1,000 watts on the roof, maybe 1,200. What I don't want to do is put 2,000 watts on the roof, but can only supply 1,000 watts to my batteries. Hmm. 
you know, it, it just doesn't make sense at that point. Is that where you would go into multiple controllers? Or a larger controller. So or these are kind of like converters. You know, they come in various sizes. And sometimes, yes, depending on how much solar you put up there, you may need to do multiple, right? Um, the largest one they make is 1,000, I'm sorry, 100 amps. And if you have a 12-volt system, that's 1,200 watts. So if you're able to get, say, 2,400 watts, yeah, you'd get two of these and do two different um, strings is what we call them, two different rows, you know, so one row of panels will go to one solar controller up to 1,200 watts. The other row up to 1,200 watts will go to the second solar controller. Okay. So that's how we just match it up. All right. So moving on to... The, See his eyes glazing over as I go. Well, you looked at me for, for like a math question, right? looking for help, and there was nothing coming back. It was just like, like a black hole over here. I don't know where five came in, so... I was just over here nodding. Sure. Help. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> numbers. You know what time it is? Right. I don't do numbers yet. All right. So we got the solar panel, solar controller. Um, let's talk batteries then. Yeah. All right. So now um, this is what you use... Uh, during the day, and this is what's going to be, you know, producing the majority of the power. When the sun goes away, yeah. What do You're, we What do we got? We got we got we got moon panels. Yeah, you got lunar panels. Well, and here's your options. Um, you got generators, and then you have batteries. Right. Which one's quieter? Right, and that's where we get into this. Well, now most RVs, um, not most, but a lot of them, they do have the generators, and, and they work good during the day, but. If you're anywhere near civil society or something like that, people don't like the the sound of your motor, right. your engine running and all that, so quiet hours. That's where we'd look at batteries, right? So here's the concept there is what do you run at night? You know, you need enough battery storage to get you through the night based on the appliances that you're running while you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. so remember that duration I was talking about? Refrigerator will always be on. Now, as long as you don't open the door, it's not going to run as much. It just wants to maintain its temperature. It doesn't lose much, um, but it's the other components, and that's where battery storage comes in. And lithium is pretty much kind of taking the scene yes. over. There, I mean, the the lead acid, AGM, all that stuff is kind of old technology going away. There's really no reason to talk about it except for if somebody has that now. Yeah. Um, and if they're just going from RV park to RV park, that's probably okay. Sure. Yeah, because but, you're using the converter right. always then. Yeah, right. but if, if you're looking to do any kind of, um, you know, maybe you want to just spend the night in a Cracker Barrel or, you know, we used to spend the night all the time. Who in doesn't want to spend the night in a Cracker Barrel as long as they keep feeding me? I'll right. There. But if you want to do any of that kind of camping, yeah. you know, go off grid, be able to um, go to different, you know, BLM lands and, and stuff. Um, Correct. Harvest host, whatever there may be, you know, they, they give you, hey, here's where you could park, but that's it. Right. Not so, a lot of resources. That's where the lithium comes in. Correct. Because it's a high demand. When you're running a, a what we call a solar system, right, we're having to take the battery power, which is typically 12 volts, step it all the way up to 120 volts. Okay. Which means I'm going to pull 10 times as much from the battery, right? The output on the, on the current side. And with current you know, with the batteries that have been around forever, the lead acid gel and AGM, they're not designed chemically to be able to produce that much flow for that long of a time. So you have to get a battery that can perform that way, and that's where lithium comes in. Right on. Right. And when they first came out, you know, we were still learning it. There was some there was some learning curves that came with lithium, and that's where, you know, people I still hear from time to time, well, are they more dangerous? Well, no. <laughs> um, lithium batteries are the first batteries in 150 years ever where we actually had technology. We put in a BMS to monitor the battery and then turn it off in the event that you know one of those parameters is out of, out of whack, too hot, too cold, um, or too fast of a draw, too, you know, overdraw, um, over amp draw out overcharge in so basically we put a computer inside to watch everything cut it off so not only now are they you know as safe if not safer because now i'm um, putting computers in there to watch it but they can perform and do the things that i need run an air conditioner run two air conditioners where lead acid gel and agm just simply couldn't so right. yeah and the solar system will always recommend well you're going to demand a lot from that battery and even a team of lead acid batteries just really can't compete right 
Right. And I hate to say it, but why, why would you want to have something that's practically the same size that you only can use half of is off gassing all oh, the yeah. time when you can just replace that with a battery that is three times the amount of stored energy? Yeah. You know, it, it, it just, it doesn't make sense. And the upfront cost, when you look at, look at it over time, it's actually a lot less expensive to buy lithium. You're just kind of paying for your batteries ahead of time. It's all up front. But 11 year warranty, heated, you know, all built in, um, Bluetooth compatibility, you know, and there's some other really cool things coming down, but we can't talk about that right now. Oh, it's getting exciting. I would, uh, I would definitely check out bigbeardbattery.com oh, on a regular basis. Absolutely. All right. So moving from batteries, let's go into the function of an inverter. So we were, we're bringing we're bringing the power in from both either the battery or the solar panel. Right now we make it to our inverter. What yeah. what are we doing? So the inverter is the magic that will take the the DC voltage coming in from the solar panels and from the battery, and then steps it up to 120 volts AC, you know, to run the larger appliances inside the RV. So that's that's what the inverter does. It takes the DC power, steps it up to AC power, whether it's 12 volts, 24 volts, or 48 volts, steps it up to 120 volts or 240, what we call split phase, to run those large appliances. They come in different sizes, no different than solar panels or solar controllers or even batteries, okay? And so you want one big enough to achieve your vision. Oh, hey, I wanna run the air conditioner. I need an inverter big enough to run that. I need to, I would like to run the refrigerator air conditioner um, and let's just say, you know, a, a curling iron. Oh, okay, then we need an inverter big enough to handle all of those loads. Mm -hmm. That's where the inverter comes in, the sizing of the inverter um, to meet your needs. And that's where I, I think um, it can get real interesting. You know, yeah. if you have a small rig and you're just really wanting to be able to boondock one night, you can get away with a smaller inverter. Oh. But if you're wanting to, you know, I've seen systems that you all have done, and there's two inverters. Basically, everything's running through that inverter. Yeah. And what's kind of cool is if you're thinking about putting a solar system together, a solar power system, um, and you're wondering, okay, well, what if I plug into shore power? So those inverters have a pass-through, right? Mm -hmm. And also your generator power is kind of passing through that through an automatic transfer switch. Correct. And everything, it just becomes like the central hub for all your power. Now, that takes a, a little more on the install side, which we can, we can get into in a little bit. But um, it, it's pretty wild what you can do because a lot of times when you buy an RV from the factory – um, I, I, and I can speak for myself of the class A that I got, I had my, my inspection, right? My PDI, everything was working and it was awesome. And then when we closed the slides and we took it out on our first trip, Mel started plugging things into the outlets and nothing worked, but the TV worked. And that was it. Our two TVs were the only thing that was on a little tiny thousand watt inverter. Right. And that's all that it came with. And we ended up having to rewire the entire system through our, you know, we went to a 3000 back then. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's, it's pretty wild what you can do. Um, even if your rig is not built with, with your future right. in mind. Yeah. And I will tell you, um, just going through all the training, both on the residential side and, and on the RV side, RV um, inverters, RV solar systems are way more uh, demanding and way more advanced, quite honestly, than uh, what we're putting in residential homes. Because you could take your 50 amp RV, which is split phase 240, and plug it into a, a, a 30 amp receptacle or a 15 amp receptacle. You don't typically get that with residences, right? It's either 240 or 120, right? But in the RV space, we can go anywhere and uh, have a system that can be designed to go anywhere and do all of those things. I mean, it's way, it, there's way more into it than even the simple home build. Yeah. But you know, a lot of people would think that's the opposite. Oh, a home build, it's got to be way more advanced. Oh, no. Hmm. All right. So we got the solar panels coming in to our solar controller hits our inverter now we have 120 volts yeah. throughout the throughout the house all right so what about monitoring systems wouldn't it be nice to know what the heck is going on with the system sometimes right yeah 
<laughs> well, and this is where uh, we live in a you know a world of information, and this is going to be one of those information overloads. Because on these systems, you can look up to the second on what's going on. You can find out how, ma- how many watts are coming down in from your solar array. You can look at what's coming from your batteries. You can determine how long you can run on that, which is kind of the main purpose. Hey, look, I got, I got this on, I have that on, and I have that on, and I'm using solar and I'm using my batteries. At what point am I going to run out of stored energy? Mm-hmm. Right? System can tell you all that. So, yeah, you you want to you want to have that system out there that at least communicates with you because again, the whole purpose of you um, going off grid is to have the conveniences of being plugged in um, to be able to run the appliances you want. The problem is you want to make sure that you have enough supply uh, to at least begin to adjust. Okay, now it's time to turn off the AC. It was great. or down to temperature, but if I keep this up, I only got an hour left. Hmm, maybe I should turn it off because my system is telling me what my current capacity is. Maybe I should turn it off and extend that a little bit, you know, longer by not having to run it so cold. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So or having put more a solar monitor, panels on. Yeah. <laughs> Which I will say that will always happen. Yeah. 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 I have yet to have one client, and I do huge systems that say, "Dang, I bought too much." Yeah. <laughs> um, what are um, well. So I remember the controller that I had, it was, it was really cool. It was a Victron. Yeah. And so the system I had, of course it was 50 amps, but sometimes I wouldn't be able to plug into 50 amps. So I would go stay with, at my parents' house Yeah. and I'd dog bone down to just an Edison plug, a little 15 amp Edison plug, but I could tell my inverter, all right, stop at, and I would just put, I think 12, 12 amps. And um, that way, if there was anything else on that circuit, I wouldn't pop his circuit. And I would just plug into any garage outlet. And so we were able to pull at least that out of uh, out of the wall. And then my Mm -hmm. batteries would pick up from from there. And and, you know, it was great. Yeah. So we call that, you know, kind of what we call a power assist when you're in limited amounts of power. In other words, you're stepping down to a 15 amp outlet. Right. You said, hey, you went down to 12 just in case a refrigerator or something in the house is on that same circuit. So what that'll do, the system will say, okay, you're telling me I can pull upwards of 12 amps, you know, on the AC input side or say from that wall. And, you know, if you want to run 20 amps, it'll take the 12 from the wall and it will match it, you know, the sine wave and pull from the batteries and solar panels to make up the rest. By doing that, it prolongs the time that you can run those appliances because, you're using the wall plug first and then making up from the rest. So, again, a wonderful convenience. Yeah, man. You know, where we can stay at a friend's house or whatever, mooch dock, and prolong the time that we're comfortable. Yeah, and the auto switching where if I am plugged into a uh, campground mm-hmm. and the power goes out, yeah, you don't know. One twentieth of a second. Because uh, things just keep going, keep running. I was here at uh, at this park. And the power went out, and I didn't know about it until I went outside, and I heard all the generators in the park running, and I was like, "What's going on?" And they're like, "The power's been out for a couple of hours." I was like, "Oh!" And I went and looked at my monitor, and I saw that I was running on solar, and right. and so it is a really nice convenience, even if you're in an RV park. Uh, it's nice to have the upgraded batteries because if the power does go out, you know you you don't have to worry about it. Correct. Yeah, you just had, you know, it's just now, it, it is good to know. So that way, because again, you only have so many uh, batteries and there are so many solar panels. Hey, how long will this last? Mm-hmm. And of course, the optimum thing is to have enough to get you through the day and night. Recharge the next day, start all over. Now, there's some other components that we didn't touch on, oh, but one, yeah. um, we can we can show some images of the different, um, what do you call those, the connection blocks and stuff, and just the way that technology is advancing yeah so bus bars and whatnot what we have to do is get the power you know the electricity from one component to another okay in order to do that whether it's cabling uh bus bars where i can have multiple sources going over to one um uh, demand or whatnot yeah we just need enough metal you know for these electrons to pass through it so you got bus bars but here's the thing you also need to put in safety devices, right? Cut off switches, thermal protection or circuit protection. This is what, you know, we call fuses and breakers. Yeah, you have to have all that because in the event that a component goes out, 
you need to be able to turn it on and turn it off, you know, through the wire. That's where breakers come in, um, disconnects come in, and believe me, there's going to be a disconnect that is needed in between the solar panels and your solar controller. Can't necessarily turn off the sun, but if I needed to work on the system, I could. I can turn off with a DC breaker. I can turn off the flow from the solar panels. So, those are some other components, you know, and we have to match those right sizes along with the cable and everything else. And I can tell you, on your build, you're looking at about 15 to 20%, I would say, in the stuff and the components, you know, total cost in the components that we're, you know, talking about today uh, in order to make the system functional. You're looking at about 15, 20% of your cost because in the cabling and disconnects and and fuses right on and i think we'll touch more on that on the installation process oh okay on on our next segment all right welcome back to the four-part series uh, that we're going to do on everything you need to know about considering um, a solar install so we're in part three now which has to do with the the installation. installation process. Installation process. All right. Now, a lot of people want to be able to do it themselves. Right. You know, a lot of DIY out there, right? I DIY'd mine. Right. And then I found out there's a lot of stuff that could have been better. Yeah. Um, wasn't 100% wrong, but there was some things that um, could have been potential problems. Right. You know, and potential problems uh, when you're dealing with electricity is not always a great thing and it could be deadly <laughs> could be deadly yeah um you know so if you don't know what you don't know it's good to ask for help yeah and this is where i'm so on the fence with this um yeah. i mean a diy a small install adding a solar panel or something like that not a big deal okay and i think that can be done and there are diyers out there but part of the diy process is is you also need to understand that you have to follow code. Code is there for safety. And a lot of DIYers find something on Facebooks or YouTubes YouTubes or whatever. Says, hey, look, I just found this diagram. I'm going to follow the diagram. And while some of that is true, you don't know about the diagram itself. And you've probably seen it all. And we're going we're gonna to touch that at the end of this segment. But some of the safety precautions you should take as an RV owner when you're, when you're installing solar panels yeah. uh, on the roof. Okay. Well, solar panels, there's no on-off switch, right? And so typically we, we install those during the day. And a couple things you need to understand is you should never install these. And while during the installation uh, process, have these, what we say, under load. I mean, as soon as you connect the solar panel over to that solar controller, which is talking to the battery, it's under load because it wants to start charging that battery. Well, if you're up there working on it, eh, you can get hit. Okay, mm-hmm. so you know there's some there's some thoughts that you have to do there. Um, yes, they can be installed and wired, and then have a, a either a breaker or a disconnect. And the breaker would always be in the off position. Disconnect would always be in the off position. You know, while you're installing it, so definitely a consideration because there's no on off switch on these things. We mm-hmm. have to put one in. And so you know, now installing them with the breaker off or not connected to anything else. Um, there's no load, but those wires, you know, if we use the proper connections, you'll never touch them, but they are hot and anything over, you know, just without sweating or anything else, anything over 48 volts, this is where we say caution, high voltage. It can, it can still get you. It gets through the juicy parts. Gets to the juicy parts through the skin. Correct. Yeah. So, and and there's a lot of things when it comes to installing, uh, the panels that is, it's probably best left to the actual certified installers, sure. yeah, especially when you're dealing with drilling into a roof, mm-hmm. um, even um, even organizing the wires and, and making sure that's yeah. secured um, back to wherever you're going in through the roof. And that's another thing, you know, where do you run the wires back down through the yeah. roof? Because not everything is pre-wired. So there's a lot to take, lot to take into consideration when you're putting solar panels in. Um, how should RV owners determine the optimal placement and orientation of their equipment? You know, we know the orientation of the solar panels. Right. <laughs> that that was, be whichever way you direct your it, RV. <laughs> that's a, that's up top. Right. Yeah. But when it comes to everything else. Face up. <laughs> yeah, fa- face up. Yeah. At a 90 degree. Minor bi- bifacial. <laughs> bifacial. There you go. Um, where, so where do you put all the other equipment? Ah, okay. So um, the inverter is not waterproof, so it has to be, of course, somewhere uh, inside. Typically, we put those in a storage area. 
Um, you give up a storage bay, a, a wall on the storage bay, maybe under the bed. Um, and the inverter, placement of the inverter and the batteries got to be pretty close together. Now, the batteries are low volts. Low volts means low pressure. Low pressure means we can't send that huge amount of um, uh, flow very far. So the inverter and batteries are pretty close together. The great thing about lithium batteries, you can move those almost anywhere. Yeah, because they're not off-gassing. You can put them inside. Um, And so what you're saying is is the battery cables, it's going to be a substantial cable plugging into your inverter. You you want that run to be as small as possible. Right. Small. Well, yeah, I mean, less than, you know, seven foot, we'll say. Okay. You know, because there's going to be a a pretty substantial voltage drop after about 10 foot Mm. cable. Um, one direction. So that's why we want to keep it pretty close. That can go, like I said, in a storage bay um, and not exposed. Um, the second thing is, anytime you're changing electricity, you're producing heat. And we need to find a way to let that vent out. Because heat builds up, that's just going to make it more inefficient. So we'd like it in a in a ventilated storage area. A lot of times you have to actually add the ventilation. Add a little square computer fan, 12-volt fan or something? Yeah. Suck okay. the air through, you know, and it's easier to suck air out than to blow it in. Mm. So the direction of your fan is also, you know, a consideration. So uh, under the bed, I will tell you, sometimes what you'll have to put up with is, is when that inverter is under a heavy load, you'll hear it humming. Yeah. And it's all up to you whether that's going to be bothersome or not. But that is a consideration. You're like, well, I have under the bed, you know, there's some pretty, you know, convenient space there. You have the dinette, you know, under the dinette, there's some space there. Uh, some travel trailers has a li- have a little bit of space up front, not a whole lot. So that's where you got to get creative, putting it inside the house somewhere. Yeah, fifth wheels are great yeah. because you got that massive storage up front, and then a lot of times where the where the generator usually is, there's some space up there. Correct. Um, class A's again, sometimes they have that space. Mine was right in that front compartment. It's just running the line to my if I wanted if you want to do a whole house, running the line back to my breaker panel happened to be in the center of the rv yeah so there's a there's a there's so many different considerations again i know we keep saying it, it it's best to just talk to a professional uh bigbeardbattery.com they have a team of uh, they have a staff of designers certified designers that have gone through your class um that can walk you through everything and it's not just batteries but it's the entire system so yeah, i always say it's not rocket science but it can be death by a thousand cuts Right, because uh, you have to be precise on everything that you do. And there's a lot of things that, you know, we see people, on, they'll send, hey, look, I'm starting this. Why well, you need to think about this? Oh, I didn't think about that. Hmm. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good so point. That is, uh, you know, again, yes, can it be DIY? Yes, it all depends on your background. Have you done electricity before? Yes. I, I don't want to say only leave it to the pros, although I'll say you're handling with electricity. <laughs> well, if, if somebody is getting a system from from Big Beard, yeah. and they want to install it themselves, you do that. Yeah. You give them a diagram. Give them a diagram. But diagram it's, it's, walk them through it. Right. But it's laid out. You have everything you need. Yeah. All the safety switches, disconnects, breakers, all that stuff, the right size cable, mm-hmm. um, the hardware for all the parts and pieces. So it, it's it's all there. So if you do have experience, it's like, you know, yeah. it's like putting a puzzle together, you know. And I remember my uh, first couple times uh, on working on the car myself. You know, as a teenager, I'm like, I don't have the money to take it into a shop. And half the time, I'd have it halfway taken apart, and then I would just have it towed up there and say, "Okay, do I get a discount?" Because <laughs> yeah, I got half I of did it half done. the work. Yeah, <laughs> I took it apart for you. And All right. So, what are some common uh, mistakes, pitfalls, and stuff that you've come across that you've seen, uh, you know, with installs? A lot of times, um, you know, people will be told, especially when, say, converting over to lithium when they first came out, you know, we were told, well, those are a drop-in replacement. You don't need to change anything. And while the lithium does get somewhat charged over time, you're going to have some problems with balancing uh, on those batteries because the early batteries and the ones you find in most of the RV market, they don't active balance. They have to passive balance, which Mm. means you have to be plugged into shore power. And it has to be top balance is another word for it. So if the existing converter charger isn't strong enough to charge it all the way up, uh, all the way up, then it's not being top balanced. So you're really running that battery down over time. Um, disconnects, proper disconnects. I'll even say we have trouble in the OEM market that we're not putting 
disconnects between the solar panels and the solar controllers. The NFPA states any source of power needs to have, you know, a disconnect. I guess it's interpretation because that wire's behind the wall. So a DIYer may go over there and say, hey, look, I've got this solar panel. I want to add more, but I've got to pull the wire out. Well, that's a live wire, mm-hmm. right? And DC will get you just as much as AC will. You know, um, so um, I think you know it's just again those those things where people had gotten some information on the internet and says, well, I'm just going to follow this. I saw one um, recently. Uh, a guy that came to class, he bought the batteries before he got here. Yeah, and it was what ten or fifteen. Oh, I, I recall. Yes, single. Uh, I think it was sixteen or fifteen or sixteen small, you know, hundred amp hour batteries. Fifteen or sixteen. There's like the they call them the minis. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And, and they were the cheap ones made in you know somewhere else. Yeah. Well, and even if they were really good, you got sixteen batteries that you need to work as one. Yeah. Right. And literally, it's hurting cats. Take sixteen people to you know pick up a piece of furniture. Right. You're like, no. Can we just get it down to one or two? Pivot. Right, <laughs> and it's it's kind of the same thing. Balancing issues, right? Distance is resistance. That electricity has to charge all of those. The lead batteries are getting charged, and the BMS is turning those off. The rest, we're like, okay, well, we didn't get anything. Mm. So yeah, you get balancing issues. This didn't you get a call? Oh yeah, it was within yeah. a couple of weeks. What do I do? It's like, but the problem was he already bought them. Right, he already had yeah. a ten, ten or fifteen thousand dollar investment. And what's crazy is. You know, was it 16? It was either 15 or 16. I can't recall. So was that four or five batteries? We would have taken up a quarter of the space. Yeah. So, all right. Well, we hope you learned something from that. If you have any questions, uh, go to bigbeardbattery.com. Link is right there. Yeah. Um, Next, we're going to talk about, you know, you got your system installed, maintaining and um, running your system. Okay. Let's do that. All right. We'll check that out next. So everybody, welcome back. This is the last segment, and this should be, you know, we're celebrating now. You figured out what you needed based on, you know, the appliances that you wanted to run. Right. Um, You had your system professionally designed, um, hopefully professionally installed. If not, you had Big Beard Battery give you a diagram, and you were able to figure it out and then work with customer support on getting it done. Now it's running and maintaining. And really, this is just, again, it's a celebration, you know. But what are some best practices for monitoring energy uses, usage ah. and battery levels in an RV solar power system? Can't so if they worked with you, what, what would they have to, to, to actually monitor that? Right. So typically in a, in, a, in a build that we always provide, you know, a servo and then what we call a GX touch. That's just basically... Um, all the information from the batteries to the inverter to the solar controller all goes to one uh, display unit, and it gives you real-time information of what's going on. It tells you the state of charge of your batteries. It tells you how much you're actually demanding, both on the AC side and the DC side. If you have solar panels, it's telling you how much is coming in. Then you got little ants. You could just follow the ants on the display, and it kind of shows you, hey, this is what's going on. The biggest problem that we have is regardless of the size of the system, you're still limited on your storage. And while you can run everything, you know, like I said, that roof is only so big and you're not, you know, very seldom can you run everything and still not use the batteries. It's learning the steady charge of your batteries, learning your energy consumption and altering it a bit just so you can either extend it or get to the next level where now you're charging, right? At night, it'd be great to run two ACs, but only the batteries get you through, so you may need to go down to one, and then you may need to maybe adjust the temperature up one degree when you're looking at it and going, ooh, do I have enough battery power to get me through the night? Right. It's a learning curve, but here's the thing you got to (laughs) do. One of the best practices is when you get your system, stay in the RV park, and then don't plug into the RV park and run your system. Test your system. Figure out, hey, with the system I just purchased, you know, first you'd find out, you know, whether you can run the AC or not, but you want to find out exactly how long. Hey, at 100%, I have ran my air conditioner for five hours. Okay, I know I've got five hours of time just with the air conditioner. After that, I need to find a charge source, mm. right? Kind of get that down. You know, it's, it's, it's a shakedown, just like you would when you buy your RV, get to an RV park. 
because now being in the RV park, you can plug back in, get a quick recharge, and to begin to write down, okay, this is how the performance works. Once you have those numbers, man, you're off to the You feel races. confident going out anywhere. Yeah. All right, how often should someone, um, an RV owner, perform routine maintenance tasks such as cleaning solar panels or inspecting wiring connections? Okay. Um, once a year on the wiring connections, uh, once they verified um, that everything is tight, and typically what we do when we do solar installs is I'll do a thermal imaging. We'll run the system. Um, and then check for heat as it's under load. Mm. You know, kind of run the AC thermal imaging scan because that definitely <clears throat> is a place where the problem is loose connections, bad connections, corroded connections always produce heat. Um, maintenance wise, there's not much else to do. The batteries, the batteries are maintenance free, and as long as you're kind of following your loads and you're not overloading the inverter, not much you need to do there. When it comes to solar panels, it's kind of hard to say how often you get up there and clean them. But again, if you're staying out in like uh, uh, quartzite, you might want to go there once a week and blow the dust off. No doubt. And that's what I was about to get to. But that'll actually reflect in your solar um, capacity coming in. If you get a system and you've ran it for a couple days and you see you got a thousand watts coming in on the same uh, comparatively the same sunny day, you know, somewhere down the line, you're only getting about 600 watts. Well, that lets you know maybe they need to be cleaned. Might be time. Yeah. So, and it is something you would do that. It would be, yeah, depending on location, how dusty it is, everything else. But um, I would also say if, it, if you have 1,000 watts and it's pulling, you know, 950 or whatever, if you could, nah, I wouldn't get up there yet. That's not worth <laughs> – the juice is not worth the squeeze to get up there and clean those at that point. Right. All right. What about uh, storing and maintaining your battery? So, say you're coming off the road. Yeah. What's the best way to store a, uh, a battery? Now, y'all – Y'alls. Y'all. Big Beard Battery actually has a storage mode, right? Yeah, it's it's an on-off switch, right? Yep. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Lithium does not dis- uh, discharge nearly as bad as um, uh, lead-acid gel and HM. just has a, a very low internal resistance, um, so it'll actually keep its charge for quite a bit. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, with uh, lithium, eh, once every six months. You'd need to recharge it once every six months. That's a maximum. I'm not saying everyone wait once every six months. But the great thing is um, you don't have to recharge them near as often as you would uh, lead acid. So that gets you through the season. But having a convenient on-off switch also turns off the brains, uh, which is kind of a parasitic draw, which is the BMS. And when you turn off the brains, there's no voltage at the terminals. You just have a sitting battery can go through extreme cold, can go through extreme heat. You're not using it, so hmm. not hurting it. So that's what the, the stow feature is. If it's not, uh, you know, our batteries still would help out there. Consideration when you're, when you're putting it up, what's the temperature, okay? And if there's an extreme temperature, extreme heat or extreme cold, make sure you're not using the battery, right? No battery works in extreme heat. It doesn't matter. There's nothing we could do with that. But with lithium, you know, when we get too cold, roughly around 32 degrees, the charge factor begins to really wane. You'll have some batteries that say they could be charged down to negative 20 degrees. What they don't tell you is it can't take a fast charge. When we hit 32 degrees, at that point, if that battery is 32 degrees, we don't want to charge it fast at all, right? You can charge it, but you need to charge it slow. Well, no one's going to do all that. So the best thing to do is when you're stowing it, turn off everything. That way it's not receiving a charge. So if you don't have an advanced storage mode button, um, the to best. avoid the parasitic draw, do you disconnect it? or Just do Disconnect you th- the negative cable, right, okay. or the, you know, the battery disconnect. The BMS is still be, going to be on. That's the only parasitic draw you can't turn off. But if you do that, and again, understanding that battery can sit there for up to six months, perfectly fine. If you already have solar panels and they're sitting outside, right, you can go into your system and lower the charge rate down to about five amps, right? Now you can go through extreme cold. You're not going to charge any faster than five amps, and you can keep the battery topped off. There you go. So there's some different options there. Yeah. All right. So are there any seasonal adjustments or precautions that RV owners should take to ensure their optimal performance on their solar power system? You know, for example, certain times of the year, the sun's in certain places, parking different angles. Yeah. Um, well, we know the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, 
right? We'd like to get uh, some good uh, long time, um, long time. <laughs> On average, you get about five to six hours anywhere in the United States. Now, of course, the closer you are south, a little bit longer you get. The further up north you are, the smaller the window. Um, you'll see people adjust, like if, especially if it's ground mount, they'll adjust the panels to try and catch early morning, kind of extend their time. To me, it's that seems to be way too much work if we have them up on the RV. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, now, honestly, keep them clean. Know that you're going to get between four and six hours, depending on where you're at, a sun strike. Make sure you got enough panels up there to take care of the load you're doing. I guess that's the key. Yeah. Maybe sure a, a portable enough. generator to kind of help out in those winter months. Yeah, very true. All right. Well, if you have any questions yeah. or if, you know, hopefully we answered a lot of questions, but if you have more questions, go to bigbeardbattery.com. Uh, there is a uh, form there that says, ask the beard. And right. literally, you are sending an email to Todd at that point. Or if you're interested in a solar design and mm-hmm. would like some help, we actually have a form that another says, I need help with the solar design. Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming to Todd and Tony's or Tony and Todd's Tech Tip Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead Tech and like, tips. like, subscribe, do all that stuff. Help us out. You know, yeah. we're trying to build a whole new channel here. So if you do like the content and, and you feel like we've earned a subscription, please click the subscribe button and tell your friends. Yeah. We'll see you next time.